While many industries have seen business suffer during the COVID pandemic, the snack food sector has soared. We all remember that time at the middle of uh, March of 2020 where the world changed. And for packaged food in general, uh, that was a great thing. For packaged food broadly, anything you could stock up for a mealtime, it was an incredible run to the grocery store. The kind of volumes no one really ever expected. Anything that is center store, shelf stable, and the supply chain could keep up with it, boomed. Consumers stuck at home are finding comfort in comfort food, and they're stocking up on snacks as new COVID variants threaten to create new supply disruptions. Mondelez, the maker of Oreos, Cadbury, and many other iconic brands, has been keeping a close eye on these developing trends. As we went through the pandemic, we started to realize, hmm, in our categories, biscuits and chocolate, the consumption is going up. There is the need for physical and mental well-being, and uh, chocolate and biscuits provide um, some sort of, uh, of relief to these tense days. Few companies are better positioned to provide that relief than Mondelez, with a portfolio of more than 60 brands led by nine global powerhouses, ranging from chocolate to crackers to cheese. And few snack food companies have a broader consumer base. Mondelez draws more than two thirds of its revenue from sales outside the United States. But for the company to make the most of its opportunities, CEO Dirk Vandeput depends on CFO Luca Zaramella to cut through the clutter and keep this huge ship on course. When the pandemic uh, started and when we started to realize that this was going to take on a global nature, uh, Luca as the CFO started to play a key role, make sure it was clear for everybody in the organization what the expectation was. I mean, this is the... Um most recent performance of the company. As you see, most of the business is doing quite well. Like every CFO in 2022, Zaramella faces some headwinds, global supply chain challenges, inflation, and ongoing uncertainties around the pandemic, just to name a few. But he brings experience and savvy that gives Mondelez executives and investors confidence in their chief future officer. He is like a walking encyclope encyclopedia of knowledge. Uh, he, he doesn't forget anything. He has an understanding of the details of a business that I've very rarely seen in any person. Defining the CFO role as only finance is very limiting. I think uh, the key uh, differentiator is about understanding the business, knowing the business, making decisions, and be selective about what you do, how you do it, and when you do it. When uh, I talk about countries, it is because I visited them, I spent time on them, and uh, I know our products, I know our people, I know our customers. Lucas Aramella has been at Mondelez since 1996, joining the company in his native Italy. Over the ensuing two decades, he worked in Latin America, Europe, and North America. I tell my daughters, I have three daughters, I always tell them that uh, what, when they ask me, what is your job? I study, I have a lot of study in, uh, in my role. I want to know what's going on in the countries, etc. And so it is about uh, different products, different consumers. We tend to believe that all consumers are equal. They are not. The, the issues you deal with in the US are very different with issues in Latin America or in Europe. And so I, I think it's a, it's a huge benefit to have uh, sort of grown up in the company. I, I came from the outside. So the combination of the two of us, uh, that gives a huge strength uh, to, to our business and, and the way we look at things. CEO Dirk Vandeput arrived at Mondelez in 2017 and a year later, Tef Zaramella to lead the finance team. So I entered the company as new and, and you start to look for somebody that can really be your sounding board on what you're thinking. You can play ping pong, I call it, with him about ideas and so on. That started very early and, and it sort of grew over time. Our CEO particularly and our board 
they are looking for someone that can uh, understand the business, can drive decisions that are sound from a business standpoint. Especially for a company that has such strength in its local market management. It's that CFO role effectively gets reframed when everything's less decision making is inherently a little bit less centralized. If you're going to keep a P&L, whether it's a formal P&L or it's a marketing P&L, you're going to measure something and you're going to do it on a local market area as opposed to a business silo globally that inherently creates a challenge that Luke has been able to solve. It requires more capabilities that maybe you wouldn't think of, of a traditional CFO role where you know you oversee a finance function. The ability to drive decisions became critical in 2020 when the jolt from the pandemic suddenly disrupted the company's traditional patterns of performance. At the beginning of the pandemic, I didn't really know what was going on with the business because you can imagine in places like India, uh, for instance, the business came to a complete stop. We business, uh, the India for us is, uh, is an operation that uh, sells more than $1 billion a year. And all of a sudden we went to zero sales. And I didn't know what was going on, not only with our people, but with the business itself. I didn't know if we had uh, cash and for how long that cash would uh, support the, the operation. We saw a boost in consumption in the US, but then India closed suddenly and but our sales went, went to almost to zero. And so dealing with this variation around the world and how to make sure that as a global company, as a total company, we got through this in a way that would allow the best for every single country around the world, that required a lot of attention, as you can imagine, from, from the CFO. I have to say we bounced back uh, tremendously well. I have to say, if I look back at the last couple of years uh, and I look at the numbers, it seems like the pandemic didn't happen to our uh, business at all. Mondelez revenues haven't missed a beat, rising year over year in both 2020 and 2021. The company projects even stronger top line growth in the next two years. But maintaining margins may be challenging with supply chains still under pressure and the cost of labor and materials rising. I've never seen physical supply chain disruption like this. Sure, normally you get cycles, you have to take some pricing to cover the cost inflation, but it's not like you can't get the products to the shelf. It, I think it starts with labor shortages around the world. That's causing knock-on impacts on freight costs, on um, ingredient costs, on physical movement of plants. I'm not necessarily worried about uh, supply at this point. I'm more worried about uh, prices and okay. uh, prices, particularly around logistics. Uh, and the run transportation have been going up uh, worldwide. Are they hitting your margins or are you passing those on to the consumer? With, in the US, for instance, we just announced pricing of uh, 6% okay. across the portfolio. That is a vote then effectively saying this is not transitory, that the if you're passing on those prices to the consumer, that's here to stay. Are you not expecting some of those input costs to go down then anytime soon? I don't expect them to go down anytime soon. I think uh, transportation, for instance, has been quite high uh, in terms of inflation for the last three years. Uh, I also know that uh, packaging costs and uh, costs related to some of our commodities are going up and they have been going up. So far, despite the highest food inflation in decades, leading producers have been able to pass on costs to customers. Mondelez saw U.S. retail sales take a healthy jump in December 2021 versus the previous year. When you pass those costs on to the consumer, you are confident that they can accept those higher prices? I am, uh, and uh, I also would like to say that uh, it is not necessarily straight price increase. We use what we call revenue growth management, mm -hmm. that is optimizing the size of the packs, that is providing multiple choices, for instance, based on consumer occasions. You might uh, realize that you don't necessarily carry with you all the time a pack of Oreo, uh, a, a big pack of Oreo, but so making the product available in smaller sizes is, uh, is critical. We optimize promotional spending. Mm. And so making sure that uh, promotions in terms of that 
uh, which means the price benefit that you give to the consumers and in terms of frequency, they are optimized. And so it is a full array of things that we are trying to leverage to make sure that uh, there is the least amount of elasticity. But reality is if you look at the market, you see prices going up and volume going up. So wow. the old concept of elasticity, higher price, lower volume, is not necessarily there anymore. Mondelez set a long-term target of 3% organic net revenue growth in 2018 when it launched a new consumer-centric growth strategy. And the company is not backing off that goal. The reality is I believe the 3% plus algorithm is achievable for this company. Also, um, we have been making acquisitions. We have been adding around about a couple of billion dollars of revenue of uh, platforms that are high growth, single digit in terms of, uh, of uh, their revenue potential. I think going forward, uh, we now have uh, a recipe. We, we are growing our global brands. We have developed local brands that play on the needs of the local consumer. We have found a financial algorithm that allows us to constantly increase the investment in our brands. Coming up, Mondelez has developed an appetite for M&A. Lucas Aramella tells me how the company makes sure that its acquisitions deliver maximum value. It is about, yes, filling geographical gaps, but it is also about ensuring that uh, we fill gaps in our portfolio. This is Bloomberg. Mondelez is a young company with old roots. It was created in 2012 in a split with Kraft Foods, which dates all the way back to 1932. In its early years, Mondelez was a takeover target, attracting the attention of billionaire activist investors Bill Ackman and Nelson Peltz. Peltz pushed for a merger with PepsiCo, and when that failed, he later joined the board to oversee a cost-cutting push. He'd taken a, a chunk of shares put pressure on the company, eventually took a board seat from 2014 onwards, and really just said, don't worry about the top line. You know, if your margins, if your operating margins are only 12%, why are you worried about the top line? You've got to focus on improving those in order to create long-term value for the company. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, they did exactly that. And for three or four years from 2013 to 2017, 2018, we saw a monstrous margin improvement. So when Dirk van der Poel came in, um, his remit was to get the top line going, and he did. It's because of the work that was done before I arrived that we were able to focus on growth after my arrival. So let's now focus on what drives our growth, building our brands, investing more in our brands, getting distribution in the channels where we were underdeveloped building our geographical presence, and so on. Mondelez is also building through acquisition. Since 2018, the company has added about $1.5 billion in revenue in deals across a number of consumer segments and geographic markets. If you think about the latest acquisition of Chipita, that is a platform that allows us to start competing in croissant um, with a seven-day brand. We can apply our brands to those portfolios that we acquire. So it is about, yes, filling geographical gaps, but it is also about ensuring that uh, we fill gaps in our portfolio. And uh, particularly in the case of baked snacks, we are very keen because the, it is a category that uh, is massive. There is no consolidation in that category yet in terms of manufacturers uh, around the world. It is high growth and we can apply our brands and our know-how to deliver cost synergies. I think what Mondelez has done is very smart. They've targeted areas that are still quite fragmented, but growing uh, and profitable. So areas like snack bars, areas like cakes and pastries, and I think the deals that they've made are pretty smart. With a growing lineup of brands and a widening global footprint, portfolio optimization is a priority for Mondelez. Portfolio uh, optimization is, uh, is really ongoing. But reality is, as a company, we have a lot of uh, brands and a lot of local brands that mean a lot to our local consumers. Mm -hmm. So the Indian consumer and the way you reach them and target them is very different than the way you would reach and target an American consumer, for example. Yes, it is. Um, having said that, one of the biggest success stories in India is Oreo. 
<laughs> and uh, we have been able to uh, sell quite a bit of Oreos in the last couple of years. Uh, I think we crossed the $100 million mark for that brand in India. And so uh, there are a lot of nuances, but there are also a lot of similarities. Our brand still have a huge uh, runway of growth. For instance, Oreo, one of our biggest brands, is growing uh, uh, double digit um, or close to double digit uh, for a $3 billion grant. That's pretty impressive. In 2020, Mondelez opened its new global headquarters in Chicago. One of the places Luca Zaramella spends a lot of time is this conference room, where teams can display and discuss data, stay informed, and stay connected. And here we can uh, track and monitor the performance of our company throughout the world, of our competitors. We can uh, measure and take a look at uh, balance sheet, cash flow, etc. Mm -hmm. And every month we spend three hours with the CEO in this room where we go through a Q&A session and where we analyze data, we point to uh, things that are working very well, where we need to make further investments. But we also talk about things that don't work that well. And uh, so we have follow-ups with the segments and the regions and the business units about it. When Luca Zaramella isn't crunching numbers or working with his team to solve strategic problems, you can often find him on his bicycle. It's a pastime he tries to pursue every day. It is about uh, performing well, but also having a strategy on how you compete with others. It is an individual sport, but it is also a team sport. And it gives me the opportunity to talk uh, to a lot of people and uh, see an always moving environment. Always on the stationary bike or do you have an outdoor bike? I also go outdoor and uh, we are in Chicago. Um, the temperature outside is uh, around about 10 degrees these days. <laughs> and I have to say yesterday I went out with my bike, uh, a freezing temperature. And uh, um, yeah, I prefer going outside if I can. They say the physical toughness makes you mentally stronger as well. Maybe that's part of it. Yeah, I think uh, cold is just a perception uh, if you don't think about it you can go and, uh, and exercise outdoor. Up next, Luca Zaramella shows me around Mondelez's glittering new global headquarters. He tells me how he sees the future of office work. We want to give our people flexibility and uh, if anything, what we have learned over the last couple of years is that we can run the company effectively uh, from, uh, from remote. And how being a chief future officer is as much an art as a science. I think to be successful in a role like this, it is not only technical knowledge, it is about passion, it is about caring. This is Bloomberg. In 2020, Mondelez moved its global headquarters from suburban Chicago to a building in the city's booming Fulton Market neighborhood. The roots of the company uh, have been in Chicago. I think when I thought about opening a new uh, headquarters, the main thing we were looking for was to make sure that we were in the middle of the consumers. And Fulton Market, where we are, is one of the areas in the U.S. with the highest number of millennials and Generation Z as a percentage of the population. About 400 employees are slated to occupy these new offices, which were designed with productivity and community in mind. We wanted to have a lot of common areas and make uh, working easier for people. And so we have a lot of light, as you can tell. We have a lot of uh, shared uh, areas. Uh, the meeting rooms, you literally walk in and uh, the computer who caps on, uh, on the screen almost automatically. And so we wanted to make this a contemporary, fashionable place um, and uh, something that is easy for people to use as a space. But over the past year, the new space has been largely empty. It's grand opening postponed as Mondelez, like so many companies, complies with public health guidelines and many employees work from home. How are you dealing with a still remote workforce, a labor force that is demanding flexibility? We want to give our people flexibility. And uh, if anything, what we have learned over the last couple of years is that we can run the company effectively uh, from, uh, from remote. 
I still believe there is a lot of value, particularly for young people to come into the office and absorb a little bit the culture of, uh, of the company. And I know for sure that uh, many people that work for me, they would like to come to the office and have that social aspect of working that is somewhat missed. Do you think this flexible work from the office, work from home is with us to stay? I think uh, it is with us to stay. I know for sure that uh, many people don't like spending hours commuting. And uh, I know for sure that uh, it might be more productive if they spend that time uh, doing something else, working or spending time with, uh, with their family. So as a company, we embrace flexibility. If the future offers flexibility to workers, it also offers opportunity to businesses to assess their need for office space and potentially redirect some resources. It has been different country by country. Uh, and so there have been some countries where we have uh, uh, reduced the office space and we are putting that money back into the business, either by giving more uh, opportunities for people to operate as they like and giving them the tools that they need, but also investing in our brands. It's all about investment for Luca Zaramella. And he realizes that patient, long-term planning yields the best returns. What's the biggest challenge in the next 10 years for you? The biggest challenge uh, is about uh, managing um, you know, costs uh, in a way that is sustainable. Because as a company, I don't think we can uh, shift away from, uh, from growth. And so that good balance between cost management and uh, investing is something that is, uh, that is required. And uh, sometimes I have to say it is, uh, it is challenging to uh, cut costs in a context where, uh, as a company, we are pursuing growth. Mondelez is also pursuing growth in a sustainable framework. The company targets a 10% reduction in emissions across operations and 100% recyclable packaging by 2025. I asked Aramella if these goals are achievable just three years away. I think they are. A lot of companies are talking about it, but I can tell you uh, there is a lot of belief in the management team specifically that uh, these are the right things and uh, we have to do them because not only our consumers, because it is right for the planet, it is right for our children, it is right for future generations. What's the biggest change that a CFO role will undergo in the next 10 years? I think it will be about uh, how we uh, as CFO, uh, CFOs run the company. It is the role of, of a CFO. Uh, it, it, as I said, the information availability is, uh, is quite uh, extensive these days. I think as, uh, as leaders, we will keep on uh, thinking about how we can make the company go better. But I also believe it is important that we spend time grooming our uh, successors. And uh, the role of, uh, of a leader today is about uh, thinking about what is needed for our people in the next five to 10 years and making sure we equip them to be successful in five to 10 years. And uh, it is completely different than, than what it used to be. What then would be the biggest piece of advice you'd give your successor? I think to be successful in a role like this, it is not only technical knowledge. It is about passion. Mm -hmm. It is about caring. It is about uh, making sure that uh, the future generations have something in their hands that uh, was built over time by people like us. They have to love Oreos, right? They do. <laughs> <laughs> Luca Zaramella clearly loves what he does. He believes in his company's products and he's using that passion along with a whole lot of data to better its financial prospects. That's what makes Luca Zaramella a chief future officer. I'm Taylor Riggs, this is Bloomberg.